What's going on, everyone? Uh, welcome to another episode of Writing Friction. And as always, today's guest is uh, pretty cool. Everyone say hello to Janet Fitch. How are you, Janet? I am very well, thank you. How yeah, are you? Yeah, we were uh, talking a little bit before about uh before the podcast we're digging the vibe behind you as opposed to the vibe behind me <laughs> it's the minimal the minimalist and the maximalist well, most definitely and uh, so you're in los angeles right yeah were you born and raised there i was really what I part was. of la i lived uh i left when i was 17 i moved up to uh oregon yeah and i lived mostly all over the west and then came back to la and, and here west i am Coast your whole life yeah okay. i've never lived east of the mississippi okay i'm a jersey boy but i moved to san francisco about nine years ago uh so i've been to la a couple of times i've been playing in bands my whole life so that's kind of la has always been a musical thing for me as opposed mm -hmm. to a literature thing for me oh uh, I mean, growing up in LA, I mean, you know, I feel like there's a couple of LA writers and Brett Easton Ellis kind of comes to mind. Um, do you think that kind of shaped the way you wrote and what you wrote about? LA? Oh yeah. Uh-huh. No, but more on the Chandler end of things, Didion, Chandler, um, Nin, uh, Anais Nin live right up the hill from where I live now, like two, two streets up the hill. Uh-huh. Um, and so, yeah, I was Bukowski. I mean, it that was more the LA that I grew up in. The oh. Eve Abbots, uh, Are you a Bukowski fan? You know, I like Bukowski. I, I, you know, <laughs> I like Miller. I like Bukowski. I like, you know, I like both the writers with a real finish to them and the writers who leave the seams. What do you mean by a finish? What do you mean by that? You know, I used to, when I was younger, I used to think, how could I write in a world where Melville wrote, you know, where, where these fabulous, elegant writers have written. And then I read um, Tropic of Cancer. Mm, it was like, okay. oh, you know, there you go. I could, you know, I could do something like that or the beads, you know, you get, uh, it, when I was younger, I, it didn't occur to me that people wrote drafts. You know, that people <laughs> I don't think it occurs to a lot of people. Didn't look like that because I, uh, you know, I kind of had to wander around, find my way in the world. So, uh, you know, Miller gave me permission to write. Interesting. Um, yeah, in the sense of what, what he was writing about or the way he, or how he wrote. How he wrote. Uh -huh. He was very, uh, you know, he let the seams show. He, mm -hmm. he uh, um, inhabited his work in a different way than I had seen. And, and he was a guy who wrote about his surroundings. I mean. And funny. And, you know, I mean, and allowed that ca the character of himself, which varied uh which i didn't realize at the time of course was very his character was very different than he was you mm -hmm. know he was actually kind of a um uh a uh, introverted person um he was a serious person he was a um you know not the rollicking guy that he portrayed himself uh, do, you, I mean, do you find that it, it, you know, meeting the authors that maybe you've met in your life, do you find that kind of dichotomy between the two? I mean, you don't have to throw any names out there, but you know, it's, yeah, I mean, you know, they say you should never meet your heroes. I'll tell you, you know, writers put the best of themselves into their work. Mm. And then life gets the rest of it. <laughs> and sometimes the rest of it is, isn't very pretty. Um, yeah everybody's had the experience of meeting their heroes and just like, I can't, I can't believe this is the person who wrote that beautiful book, you know, yeah. or those beautiful books, but it's because they put the best of themselves on the page. Uh, can, can we say that with Bukowski too? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything about Bukowski as a person. Yeah. Uh, I have a feeling that, um, you know, it was a life, that was, he had a, 
a joyous attitude towards mm -hmm. his yeah. very difficult life. So, you know, there's something to be said, but, you know, would we have been buddies? No. You know, <laughs> yeah, do I, I want to hang out with barfing up drunks? No. <laughs> he'd, be a, he'd be a hard dude to hang out with. Right. So, so you're right. So did you start writing short stories? Did you have the idea that you wanted to be a long form novel? when you I had no had idea that. what I was doing literally so you kind I, of literally I was, a, I was a history major yeah. I hadn't written anything when I decided to become a writer I Same. woke up on my 21st birthday and said that I was going to be a writer that's oh. what I wanted to be with with Anais Nin in my head you know that I was going to be have these fabulous adventures and be very glamorous and have Henry Miller as a lover you know and that whole thing um, and then I had to learn to write. Uh -huh. So yeah, I started with short with a short story and uh, discovered that I had some I had some talent for certain aspects of writing, but there were certain aspects that I I really uh, had to struggle and learn. You know, I think it's one of the reasons that I teach now a lot uh, because I had to make every mistake. I had to learn how to do a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I just knew that I wanted to, I was a tremendous reader. Well, that was going to be my next question. It, se it seems to be, you can't just dot, you, it, it would be hard to wake up one day saying, I want to be a writer, having never written, but also not being a good reader. <laughs> I was, I read, when I was a kid, my reading was more real to me than the real world was. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't give a shit about the real world. Yeah. I wanted to live in that world the you know i could be a king i could be a murderer i could be whatever i wanted to be you know i was a big dostoevsky fan mm, okay well yeah i was gonna say reading up on you seems to be russian really part of your life also. <laughs> um yeah yeah i had a conversation with julia phillips earlier today and um yeah she lived in siberia for i think four years oh that is such a good book oh, oh yeah you yeah, know I, I, I talked to her earlier today yeah she was she was gorgeous awesome. yeah i'm gonna oh. try to get her back on she was super cool i mean you know she literally hopped on a plane went to siberia <laughs> and, uh, yeah and then, that book was so well done i yeah. was a uh, uh my i was a history major and russian history was my um specialty and mm. Russian is my language and I studied there uh in Len in Leningrad when it was still Leningrad yeah, yeah, and then yeah. went back uh to do research for my the Russian books okay so all right so so you're 21 you wake up you have this idea you want to be a writer <laughs> I mean like, you know, not, not to speak hyperbolically but you know did, was the story in your mind did you wake up with a specific seed of an idea no but no was, no I my life's path uh -huh. I an exchange student in England in history, and I was doing Russian studies there. And um, I thought I was going to become an historian, but it didn't occur to me that my love of history actually was sort of a back way into writing fiction, mm -hmm. you know, because it's a it's char big character and the drama and you br have to use language to bring the reader into the story and have them understand what all the biggest characters you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and I woke up and realized I didn't want to become an historian. And, uh, you know, I wanted to live in my imagination as I generally did in those days um, anyway. And uh, then, yeah, so I had a certain idea of the kind of life I wanted to live, which was um, when I was a kid, I used to have, I had the worst teeth. I had those. Uh, you have great you know, teeth. This uh, kind of teeth. I, I said, and you got my teeth. I had to go to the orthodontist during the school day. Yeah. And I, I my school was so Dickensian. It was like the worst crappy, you know, brick public school you can uh -huh. imagine you know everybody was mean it was it was it was dickens and i loved Dickens in los angeles yeah yeah it was <laughs> and, uh, i used to get out of school during the day to go to my orthodontist mm. and to leave that prison and walk out into the morning sun and get on a bus when everybody was working and everybody was in school for those horrible teachers 
and be free and just walking around, I said, this is how I want it. This is my life. This is the way I want to be. Yeah. So it was a yearning for freedom as well as just a love of story. I mean, I lived in story. That's all I did was read and think and dream and, you know. So, yeah. So you start you start writing, you know, I, I'm going to build the scene in my head and, and fill in the blanks or correct me if I'm wrong. You start correcting these little short stories. Maybe you're working on a novel. At what point do you think I could That's actually right. do this? I mean, was there, did you meet someone? Did, were oh, you, were from you the minute I decide. To people? Uh, from the minute I decide, this is an element of my character is that once I decide to do something, it is just it is fire on stone. Yeah. It is just going to happen one yeah. way or the other. So I started writing. I read little, you know, I took extension courses. I read things in magazines. I did everything wrong. That's why I, I do a, a weekly sort of fireside chat uh -huh. thing called writer. It's called writing Wednesday. I do it on my Facebook page, the author page every week. At awesome. noon because I want to save other people from doing it, what I did. It <laughs> everything wrong you know they say send to the places you read so i was sending like my beginner three page short stories to the new yorker you know to vogue it's like <laughs> why didn't somebody tell me <laughs> yeah <laughs> and people can't see me right now but i'm pointing to myself yeah but i didn't know i was a type in why portland not? oregon i didn't know any writers i didn't yeah. i was just picking up information as i went along so i'm one of those you know if you ever watch Gattaca, you know, I'm one of those born in the wild, you know, uh, uh, people who didn't go through a program or anything. I just had to fail a lot. Do you, th I mean, uh, this podcast, one of the big, I should have it painted on the back behind me, it should be failure. Um, and the idea of just, you know, a lot of authors I talked to, you know, they, they, they took that first manuscript, they, you know, threw it in, a, you know, they burned it, they got rid of it, you know, all these things, all these things. Um, when you're working in those early days, I mean, you're, you're telling me that you're just the kind of, you know, you're spearheading it. You're, you know, you're going to get this done. You're going to get this done. Were you also getting, you know, joy out of it too? Was it a way that really, I mean, were there days where, you know, maybe oh, yeah. it wasn't flowing, but you still knew, you know, it was, you know, not every day is going to be sunshine and roses kind of thing. Most days were not sunshine and roses. Mm -hmm. And occasionally, I mean, this is, and the same thing now all these years later yeah you know um you're, there's always like a vague sense of nausea and then you know when you're hitting it because that lifts it's like oh now i'm right you know um but yeah I, I i wrote short stories that i sent out like every week every week every week i had like you know 20 stories circulating 30 yeah. stories circulating and rejections coming back every week uh -huh. every week every week and um, I had to, so it, it took me like 10 years to publish my first short story. Mm. It's what it is. Uh, you know, I had a party when I sold my first novel. I had a party and put all my rejections up on the walls of my living room. And they reached from the baseboard to over my head on oh, all yeah. four walls of my oh. living room. Oh yeah, be a nice so, wall at this point, right? So you know, I'm a great hater. So I get rejections, and it just fuels me up. It's like, <laughs> well, that's what it is. Son of I mean, a bitch. <laughs> yeah, my my first book got published you know three weeks before the world ended, and everyone's sick of hearing about it. But you know, I got rejected by over seventy different agents, and it's like every oh, the agent thing. Well, I mean, again, we can. Yeah the whole episode on just that yeah. um that's an interesting thing and you being in well again i'm learning i'm new to the whole world um it seems to be you know i'm from i'm a jersey kid i grew up you know but it seems to be the book world is new, heavily new york based whereas you being an la person you know people think agents entertainment is la based um but it's not but growing up i mean you grew up around show business right i mean just kind of by nature or no my father was an engineer my mother worked for the city okay okay i mean never... i grew up la is a huge city well of course of course yeah everybody doesn't work in the entertainment industry <laughs> you know people have regular jobs and it's a regular place 
it, yeah, my aunts, uncles, grandma, you know, it's. So then, it was, then I was, was a big movie person. I mean, I would fake illness uh, on a regular basis to both my parents work. So I would stare at a light bulb until my nose ran and my eyes ran and oh, I'm sick. I, can't uh -huh. remember, I hated school so much. And I would sit home and I would watch movies all day long, movies and read. And, you know, to me, that was paradise. So I was, the movies affected me, but as art, not as industry. Not as something you were surrounded by, just by living that kind of thing. Yeah. No, it was, it was the stories. Oh my God. Those movies made out of Tennessee Williams. Oh plays. yeah. Oh, I was so in love with those. And, you know, just living in the movies. I love noir, a lot of, you know, a lot of noir. Oh, yeah. And I, I'm sort of a noir. I have a streak of noir in, in me. And San Francisco is wonderful for that. Well, I, I was gonna, it's literally breathing with it. So, so then what was that next step then to having to deal with an agent? Um, I was trying to get short stories written. I took a short, expensive hiatus in film school briefly for a semester and realized that I don't play well with others. Okay. I want to be God of my own planet. I just want it to be exactly the way I want it, which what the hell, you know? <laughs> so I had been writing short stories. I went back to short stories um, and I was living in Colorado. I was the editor of a small town newspaper. I mean, really small. The circulation was 900. The town was a thousand in town, a thousand out in the country. Okay. That was my, my paper. And I work, did it for two years and it was a 24 hour day job, you know, because people would call you at dinner and say, my kid just caught a big fish and I want mm -hmm. you to come over and take a picture of it for the paper. And you'd go over and you'd interview the kid. I mean, I could interview this pen after having that job for two Definitely. years. Yeah. Um, I did everything. I did the gossip column. I did the police blotter. I did everything but sports because that was important. <laughs> they had I was going to say a lot of gossip happening. Yeah, I went to the, to the hairdressers. There were two beauty shops and I just, because I was not from there. Yeah. I went, I'd have to go in and say, so what's happening? Oh, so-and-so is getting married and you should go over and call them and you know see what they're serving. And they told me how to do it basically. But after two years of that, I just couldn't, you know, I'd been writing already for 10, 10 years, more than that by that time, maybe around then. Uh -huh. And uh, I quit and I wrote 18 short stories that next year. And uh, somebody I knew, my ex-husband or then husband's uh, boss, he was a DA, uh, left office to become a mystery writer full time. Oh, wow. And he was the only writer I'd ever met. Yeah. So I said, can I, you know, would you read these stories? And he took the stories and said, would you mind sending, if I send these to my agent? I said, no, I, this is a tiny mountain town, tiny. Yeah. Do you mind if I send it as my agent? He sent it off to the agent. His, the agent wrote to me, said, I'm, the, this is not a short story collection. This is just a bunch of stories. Okay. <laughs> but if you ever have something I can represent, a novel, um, I would be happy to represent you. And he also suggested one or two of the short stories would make good a good novel. Interesting. So I wrote, I wrote the first one and no sale, wrote the second one and it circulated for like four years and finally did sell. Um, young adult. It that, was a five, that was a five year gap between finishing those roughly those two novels and then selling that first novel roughly. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Roughly, Rough, maybe yeah, a little, yeah. maybe less. But it was it's important. People need to hear this. People short, think this happens overnight. It was young so. adult, which is, I wrote it because he thought I could sell it, yeah. which I did. But yeah. it wasn't what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um. By that time, I had moved back to Los Angeles, um, and just kept writing the short stories and getting better, getting better learning the craft, learning the art, you know, 
um, I got a rejection from one of the, my 400 rejections uh, saying good enough story, but what's unique about your sentences? <laughs> I go, in my sentences, what? oh God, what does that mean? Oh. What, I'm a history major. What does that even mean? Yeah. And then I realized it was like those, like those movies where they climb to the top of the foothills and they're like, we, you know, they climb to the top of the mountain. It's like, we're, I made it to the Himalayas, you know, I made it. And then they look up and then they see the, the, the real peaks that they haven't, they just got to the foothills. Mm -hmm. That's, that was that moment for me. It was like, oh my God, the things that I know how to do character, plot kind of stuff. And, you know, I have not even started the big climb. I had to learn how to make beauty on the page. You know, one word up against another word, you know, to have some music and some beauty and something that makes the reader want to linger as well as wanting to move forward. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the best thing. So I had to learn to write. I had to learn everything. Again, the theme seems to be rejection. And it's the idea, <laughs> well, no, in, in, the best, in the best way possible. You know, but again, it's the kind of person who can take that rejection and you know, get hungry, hungrier from it. It feeds yeah. you. It feeds whatever's inside of you or you're going to keep- Rage. Going for it. it feeds- Yeah, whatever it is. You know, like, yeah, you know, you could- I'll show you, you son of a bitch. Exactly. Like, you know, fuck you. You know, like, you get these, these sentences and it's just, you know, but that's- But that guy, I knew he was giving me the keys to the kingdom mm. when he said, what's unique about your senses? Like, I didn't even understand what that meant. It took me like six weeks to figure it out. Mm -hmm. But he gave me- you know, he gave me the golden key. Uh, usually they reject you. They don't tell you anything. They no. just say, does not meet our needs at this time. Mm -hmm. you know, or, this guy, or another agent would love this. <laughs> yeah, this guy said, you have, you know, your sentences are not interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And did it take, a, it just took a lot of soul searching to kind of just figure out what it is you thought he meant by that. Oh my God. Well, I it just couldn't. You know, it was like scrying chicken entrails. It was like, yeah. I know there's something here. He's trying to tell me what. what? So, um, and I realized I needed to work. I needed the poetics. I needed poetry. So I started working with a teacher who was teaching fiction, but she was a poet. And the, the things she didn't have, I already had. Mm -hmm. So I didn't care whether like she didn't care about plot she didn't care about whether anything happened <laughs> you know she, but she sure cared about a beautiful line yeah and uh really sharp dialogue and you know um all the things i needed so i you know i had to learn my craft yeah um you know i, I mean I, i'm a reader before i'm a writer and, you know, there are times where I want to dive into, you know, some heavy duty, you know, I'm a big John Updike fan, um, you know, and, you know, that's some dense material. You know, I've been trying to get through to some Saul Bellow, but even that's a little dense for me. But there are times where, and I, it's only been recently, I've kind of allowed myself, my, my father would call it airport reading. Um, but, you know, just seeing you're shaking your head, you know, and talk. but like, you know, every now and then there's, some, there's something to be said about just like, you know, he walked into the bank he pulled out a gun. He said, this is a robbery, you know, and there's things like that too, but it's interesting to hear how you wanted to, and you were told that you needed to, you know, or you felt the, the need to be more poetic with your words and your sentences. And your I words. needed to have language as yeah. well as story. You know, when I was in college, there was a political science teacher named Stephen Kapsch, and he had something called the Kapsch Continuum. And it was a vector. So it was a solid dot on one end and an arrow on the other. And so there was a solid dot and then this arrow that went up. And it was the line between duty and aspiration. <laughs> and duty is a, you know, there's just a solid dot there. And then it goes as high as you want. And in any art form, you know, you can do the 
the doot, you know, you can do the doot, you know, and he walked into a room and he pulled out the gun, blah, blah. But there's no end to how good it can be. Oh, for sure. So yeah. my aspiration, my ambition is up that, up that vector. I am going. I, yeah. That's what I want to read. That's what I want to do. Um, Why not go for the best in everything? I, I mean, mean, like you said, well, you're like a bag early. of Doritos is fine. It's not very nourishing. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I can make you a beautiful four course meal, you know, why would I bring you Doritos and bean dip? You know, in a, in a can. Yeah. And so there's also something to be said for the people who are satisfied by a bag of Doritos and bean, yeah. Because they, they have not had a loving, beautiful four course meal exactly. for them. Um, so, so obviously, you know, you find huge success, obviously with your book, White Oleander after that, you know, and this is not going to turn into an interview about that, but what do you do as someone, as an author who, I don't know if that success was kind of out of the blue. I, I, I don't know enough of the story behind it. You're shaking your head. Yes. So yeah. what do you do after that success to just. You crash and burn. It? Of course. No. Of course. You know, cause you think you have to do bigger, better. And then you completely get fucked up. Uh -huh. uh, you feel like an utter failure. You feel like an imposter. Uh, I was, I got my, my editor sent a photographer to take author picture for the, a book that I couldn't write. A complete an utter mess three years i was lying to everybody how's it going great oh it's fabulous you know i was i had rented an off uh, a studio thinking i could maybe i would do better if i was at the studio i would just go and sleep i would sleep there i would come home and i would sleep here uh i was also having some marital problems uh -huh. <clears throat> so it was a really dark time for me Three years, I'd taken two runs at this enormous historical novel and uh, complete failure, lying, you know. And finally, I had to, I, I confessed to my editor. He, he had his, secret, his assistant call me and say, could you just tell us the name of the book so we can put it into the schedule? And I burst into tears and I said, I can't talk to you about it. Can you please put him on the phone? And uh, she did, and, and I said, there is no book. It is a 900 page mess. And I have started something else that is just three people and one of them's dead. And it's a novel about suicide in punk rock LA. Uh, and he says, is it going? I said, yeah, it's <laughs> finally going. And uh, he says, pack up that other book and just send the whole thing to me, get it out of your writing space. Yeah. And so that's why Paint It Black is such a dark book. The second book, the, the punk rock book, yeah. um, is because that's came out of the White Oleander experience. Yeah. Um, well, and behind your other, your shoulder, people can see you have another book, again, talking about going forward. Um, so you write Paint It Black. And again, are you looking in your rear view mirror at that point? Or is it, it now you just got to, you got to push forward, push forward and just kind of. No, it was like, oh, I remember how to write. Well, I know okay. how to do this. Yeah. Oh, this is pretty good. Yeah. You know, and then I got my legs under me again. And once that, the second novel is a very difficult book. Mm -hmm. Always, especially if you have a successful first book. Well, it's it's game music, the sophomore slump. That's right. Well, it's like you, the first album took you all your life you had to, to write all, right to all those songs. And then they want the next one in a year. Oh, you know, so they force it and then it's crappy. And then that's the end. While you're it. touring for the other record. <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, then I ended up writing the, a big historical novel yeah. that, a character left over from that disaster. I just couldn't get her out of my mind. And it ended up being the Marina uh, Makarova, the, uh, the revolution of Marina M. And then the new one is Chimes of the Lost Cathedral. We so love it. this is her. And it was only 12 years for the two books. So, but I, 
learned, there's a wonderful quote from Dorothy, Al the writer Dorothy Allison, the novelist, uh, that fiction never exceeds the writer's courage. So I thought, if you just don't fall off, you take the horse's mane and you wrap it around your hand and you just cling on, it doesn't have to be beautiful, you know, at least the first draft. Um, it does have to be beautiful, of course, but mainly you don't fall off just because you're afraid. Yeah. I mean, there were times in there, year eight, it's like, I'm gonna be writing this for the rest of my life. This is going to destroy me. It's gonna destroy my career. I'm never ever going to finish this, but I stayed on it and I got the, we had this, you know, first draft that was both books. And it's like, I kept telling my editor, this is getting really long. And she said, um, finish the whole shape of it and we will figure out how to publish it. And so I got the big shape and then she sa I said, I'd like to do this as three books. She said, I see this as two books. It seems to clearly divide into a coming of age novel and then a, a woman who has come of age dealing with the effects of her choices. So it divided in half. And then I finished the first one, Mar the revolution of Marina M about the Russian revolution. And then the second one finishes the revolution. Uh, my character's a poet. So originally the idea was to do the whole book in verse. The first 17 chapters were in verse. Oh, yeah, well, the, poet. Okay. <laughs> the problem is that I got into some areas on the book that I needed to um, use all my tools as a fiction writer, because I didn't know what would happen. Uh, the poetry is fine if you know what's going to happen in the scene, but if you don't, you have to live through it with the characters. And then I was writing prose. So, um, but I did write all the poetry in the book. There's a lot of it. Uh, I wrote all the fictional, her poetry and, and her circle of poets, but also I got original translations of some of the real poets who are also characters in the book, you know, Vladimir Mayakovsky and Anna Khmatova. Uh, these are real people in the book. And I have a friend who's a translator who did original translations of those poems for me. We love it. So, well, uh, Zoom's, Zoom's giving me the red light, Janet. Okay. This was a, this was a blast. I feel like we could talk for at least another hour. Of course um, we can. Maybe you again. Know, before, and, uh, what was the name of the new book so people can know, hear about the it? The new book is called Chimes of a Lost Cathedral. Perfect. And that's a, off of a Russian legend about the drowned city of Kitej. Uh, that the faithful can hear the bells from under the lake. So Janet, thank you so much so, for spending time talking to me. Very, very... Very well, uh, quite a pleasure. So yeah, no, we'll do it again for sure. Sure, and Absolutely. please enjoy that. And please enjoy the Los Angeles weather. That's what it's for Henry Miller's birthday. All right, see you later. See ya. Bye. Bye.